It's April 7th, and welcome to Trips and Traps. I'm Richard Migliari, joined by my main man, Ernie Munich. The M&M boys are in the house. Ernie, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing 48 hours away from the big day, Wood Memorial Day. How many of those in a lifetime? Oh, I, I, so many before I rode, got to ride in a bunch, actually win one. It was fun. But we got five races to look at, so we're going to jump right in so we don't stretch this out too long. Sure. And we've got one day with a lot of muddy track races to look at, but let's start on April 1st, the fifth race, and we're going to be taking a look at Bonita Luna from the inside post. And I think, Ernie, this is a great illustration of a live horse that was compromised by a bad post. And I think that's a great point, Mig, because for me, it was simply a case of this horse being used more than she's accustomed to, and she was under fire. Look at the second horse with Eric Consell, the two outside in the green silks, putting pr under s pretty hard pressure here, and the one has to go. Well, you know, I think that um, Jackie Davis on Bonita Luna wanted to ease back at one point. You can see the, the carriage of her head. She's trying to get out a little bit, so if she takes back more, she's going to put herself in trouble, and you're going to see her take a peek over her right shoulder at some point in here, and when you see other horses right in behind you, if you slow down, now you're caught in behind them. Actually, Eric Cancel had control of the situation, being the one on the outside, and he was intent on going forward, and it kind of forced Bonita Luna into this kind of trip where she was under that pressure, but this is about post positions. I don't blame Jackie Davis. I love it, and Mig, when you're in, in Jackie's situation, it must be there's a, and I'm, you must know that you're in deep. You committed, you kind of have to. There's traffic behind you. It must not be the best feeling in a situation like this. Well, well, absolutely not. And also, you're on the favorite. You're on a live horse, so there's an X on your back. Everybody knows they've got to try to beat you. But if you don't, if you take back in that situation, you're taken back into trouble. You commit to the inside. It's like the difference between bacon and eggs. The chicken's involved, the pig's committed. Well, she was certainly the bacon here. And, you know, she's won on the lead before. But she's not going to win on the lead when she's under this type of pressure. Well, and, and very legitimate to fast fractions for this yes. caliber of horse. Definitely. And she was under the gun every which way. But this is a filly I think you want to follow back. If she gets a different draw, she was claimed out of the race by Oscar Barrera. And I think with a different post position, she can set up a different kind of trip. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold this race against her. And I wouldn't hold being claimed against Oscar Barrera against her. I missed that. I didn't see that. And if you look, his last four or five claims, maybe only one win, all have hit the, three of those have hit the board, all have run well. Don't let that scare you away from this horse. He's doing a great job. His horses look great. And for me, on a personal note, I love to see those hot pink and black silks oh. harking back to the day when his dad was ruling the roost around here. How many times did you ride Creme de la Fette? Well, I won six, wait, 16 times on him. I don't know how many times I, I, I rode him, but... Can you even process that? Yeah. He won 16 <laughs> times on Creme de la Fette. Most I ever won on one horse. That is unbelievable, historic, and Guinness book. Well... It's yes. Trips and Traps yes. at the Richard Migliori Show. So let, let's continue on, right. and we're going to turn the page and move on to April 2nd. It was a claiming championship day, muddy tracks all day, and we're going to start out talking about number four here, Tug of War, and you're going to see he breaks a bit slowly. He is turning back in distance, so you expected him to be outrun early, but it took him a little while to settle and find his stride. I thought this horse ran a remarkable race. Now, he's, he's a grinder, and he's going to keep coming and coming and coming. Now, do you think there's anything John Bassono could have done to maybe get him in the game earlier, or he just does not want to be rushed? No, I, I think he rushed him as much as he could to try to stay in contact, and I don't blame John for that. I think John might have made a poor decision later on when he, was, when he decided to angle in between horses. Now, I understand saving ground, and we're going to see a race later where a horse saved every inch of ground and angled out to the middle of the track and finished strongly. But I think when you get a horse like this rolling, the last thing you want to do is stop any of his momentum. He may have been better off, and we're going to see him as they turn for home. He's going to make a decision to go inside of the horse in the red. And you can see he's pretty far back, so I don't blame him for saving ground, Ernie. But I think at some point, maybe the prudent thing would have been to do is to angle out straight into the clear. Because you're going to see he's going to wind up encountering just enough traffic to slow him down. And just keep this in mind, even after all this is said and done, and as you're going to see this horse, Mig, is going to hit a little bit more traffic right as they approach deep stretch. Just keep in mind 
that this guy has not won going six furlongs in more than three and a half years. Well, and, and it is a part and parcel because he is a bit slow early, but you saw the two-horse, Colin Smiler with Arad Ortiz Jr., come out and take his path. It made John Bazona have to make a decision, angle back to the inside. Horse jumped his leads, and then even as they got closer to the wire... He's still not in the most comfortable yeah. position. And when you get a horse that's going to make that one big run, I think you need to just save as much ground as you can early and get him in the clear because you don't want to slow him down. You know, sometimes I see a jock finishing, and when, there's, when they're finishing in traffic and they're going like this, they have so much horse, there's not even, not, there's not even space for stick. Or time for a stick. Yeah. You just know it's a horse to watch. Yeah, and, and listen, to be fair, I mean, John was trying to do the right thing. Yeah. I think Irad Ortiz coming out as abruptly as he did, and he was clear. It wasn't a foul, mm. but, you know, it, it changed the, the, the path that he had, and it made him have to make decisions when you just want to be going forward. Yeah. Well, we just keep going. The same day, just the very next race, we're going to look at the uh, third race here, and we're looking at number one, Distinctive Lady. Breaks, uh, okay. I mean, I, I thought she broke maybe a half a step slow. Ernie, I think this filly worked out a tough trip because I don't think the inside was the place to be. Well, that's what I'm curious about, Meg. Is this historically an issue when, when Aqueduct gets muddy that they want to stay away from the rail? Or are they just following because one guy jumps off the roof, everyone's jumping off the roof? And the rail was mostly clear, especially through the stretch during the day. Any reason for that? Well, you know, the track was sealed. I think it has less bounce in it, so it's not as live. Horses aren't getting over the ground. They're kind of thudding instead of bouncing over the ground. And I think if you watch the eventual winner, the two, um, uh, with Jose Ortiz, Sweet Ray of Sunshine, he came out running, got his position going forward. When the five out ran him, he, he was able to save enough horse, but he angles off the rail, and that allows Distinctive Lady to take the rail. Maybe real estate you didn't want to own. Yeah, it's very interesting. And this is, this is a... A horse who, although has run well on wet tracks, I think is also better on the fast track. Maybe a slight class drop. Carlos Martin doing very good work. And you can see the winner now. At least two paths. is going to be more than that off the rail. But they're one of the few horses all day to stay tethered inside Distinctive Lady. Yeah, and, and I will say this. I think Distinctive Lady will be better on a fast track. The one thing that truly puzzled me, and I was doing the post spray for this race, was that Gabriel Saez did not warm this filly up at all. I mean, hmm. basically, he jogged her to the gate. And I think it's extremely important, particularly with muddy or off racetracks, to warm a horse up good, get them comfortable on it, make sure that they have confidence on it. You don't want their first fast step to be in the race. Is, this, should the, is, is it possible there were instructions, or should there be instructions? Well, in it's very possible that, that it was instructions. But I will say this. If I was training horses, and if I was still riding... I warmed horses up. Yeah. They're athletes. You want to make sure that their blood rate is up, their heartbeat's going, and that they're clued in to what's going to happen. And this filly kind of seemed a little lackadaisical early. Mm -hmm. Now, I, think, I don't think she was going to win. I think the winner was best. But I think it's all about giving horses their best opportunity. Cool. And I'm just not convinced this filly had that on this day. Very cool. We'll move, turn the page, and we'll head to the race four, the very next race on the same card. Boy, we got a lot of mileage out of this claiming championship day. <laughs> Lucky Lotto, a horse that obviously, and we're talking about number two, Lucky Lotto, breaking from the rail. He broke a bit slow. Again, I don't like inside posts going seven furlongs or a mile on the inner track, I mean the main track. It's a lot of empty space. Horses tend to break a little bit lost. Lucky Lotto has proven to be better on the inner track, but I think breaking slowly made him be further back than he should have been. This is such an interesting horse, Mick. Every, I mean, I like everything about him. A horse who spent so much time on synthetics, finally found out that he's a dirt horse, better on dirt. I think he also prefers running outside. Look at that race he ran when he just blew up on the inner. And you see where he is right now. Well, this is where I think Eric Cancel maybe would have been better served to try to wait and go outside. You've put yourself inside of the eventual winner, Mr. Palmer, who is the horse to beat. He's got a top rider on him in Irad Ortiz Jr. You are basically in his pocket. He owns you from this point on. And you can see he's compromised. And Irad's not going to let him out of that, that trick bag. He's going to hold him there as long as possible. And I think Lucky Lotto's a horse that needs to build into his stride. And he's being basically compromised. I think this was something that Eric Cancel will learn from. This is the polar opposite trip of the one when he ran against the bias and exploded on the inner in his previous race. And as you say, Mig, once he finally gets some clearance and is extricated from that spot, we see a different horse. But, you know, a Belmont might work very nicely on a fast track, flat mile. He's run huge at Belmont, even though he loves the inner. 
He has run huge at Belmont. Yeah, and listen, he's a real nice horse. Eddie Barker's been doing great work. Yes. We talked about Tug of War, one of his horses earlier, Lucky Lotto here. Now, he may not have beaten Mr. Palmer under any circumstances on this particular day, but I think he should have been at least second. And if he would have gotten Definitely. clear down the backstretch, it would have made, I believe, a big difference. You could see he wasn't comfortable with the kickback. He was uncomfortable in between and in behind horses. Um, Lucky Lotto's a good horse. I think the trip set up wrong for him once he broke a bit slowly. I agree. I think he absolutely would have been second. And you know, Mick, maybe, maybe an outside shot. It would have been a lot closer, definitely. Well, if you get out, if he gets outside of Lucky Palmer, I mean, Mr. Yeah, Palmer, yes. right? Lucky Lotto. Yeah. Maybe he's the one that's got Giving him, him in the, the trick bag. You know, you, you got to think if you reverse the, the positions, how the, the trips might have been different. Absolutely. Well, let's move on to our final race of the day. And this, this is a race I thought... There were a couple things that puzzled me, and we're going to look at number four, Push Me, Pull You, under Aaron Grider. Now, you know there's no bigger fan of Aaron Grider than me. I think he's an aggressive rider. He's a smart rider. She broke cleanly, and I just question why Aaron didn't go forward and continue to hold position midway down the backstretch when some horses, albeit did make early runs, I think it wind up compromising this Philly strip. Well, she gets in a position where she ends up getting a lot of mud, in her, uh, you know, eating a lot of mud between horses, a lot of traffic, and, Mig, you're thinking at this point maybe he sh should have pushed the issue a little bit to get himself clear? Or just maybe to hold that position instead of allowing these horses to kind of get over and then drop it, you know, over in front of him. Now, he's in an uncomfortable position from this point on, always in between horses, always searching for, for some sort of clear space. And I just think this filly wasted a lot of energy fighting for that position every step of the way. The eventual winner's down inside of her, and, and she's going to save all the ground Shakespearean dream. But you're going to see later on how that one's able to come out in the clear and be unhindered, where this filly basically never has space to herself the rest of the trip. And what I like about this trip, Mig, is that I, I wondered if maybe she had lost a step and wondering the subtleties that she ended up overcoming here makes me think that she hasn't, and turf is on the way. I think she might be better on turf, but Mig, as you are, uh, pointed out, she's among, but once she has some clearance... I thought she came on again. It wasn't an eye-catching move, but it was right. definitely a move that she was going forward at the right time. Now, you see if she's looking for room. The eight horse is going to drift out. Look where the eventual winner is at this point, who had been inside of her earlier. And you're going to see there's going to be some bumping going on. And I think a lot of energy was expended always fighting to hold a spot instead of kind of getting clear and being able to breathe and go forward. And you're going to see this Philly kind of runs on. I don't. She never quit. She never gave up. And that's what I liked about it. One... Detail after another against her. And having said all that, still gets third. Obviously, she still has run. And also, different conditions. And we can see from the head-on the type of traffic she had to deal with. Through the yeah, and, and this was around the turn as well. I mean, maybe not as much body game. But you can see here, you'd be surprised how much that actually takes out of horses, that, that kind of contact. Especially when they're already tired. They're, they're trying to get their air. And you see, she's always kind of in a claustrophobic space. You would like to see her have a spot where she just was a lot freer. I think this is a Philly turf or dirt coming back that you really want to take a long, hard look at. I agree, and I think even as far as, a, you know, maybe even as long as nine furlongs would work for her, and uh, I think this was a subtle trip. Maybe at the end there with a the little bit of bouncing, people will know. Sure. But, she, you know, she's the type of horse that doesn't get bet heavily. Very interesting play coming back. You, you know, and again, to be fair to Aaron Grider, I don't know what the instructions were. Maybe he was told not to be a part of the pace. Um, I think Aaron's a terrific rider, and one of the things I like about Aaron is he's a guy that does hold position. So yeah, this was a bit out of character, this trip. Um, and again, we don't, we're not privy to what was told to him on how to ride the horse. So yeah. we've got to be fair. Absolutely. And you can, I love when you can see these jockeys thinking out there. And there is no smarter jockey than and Aaron. You can just know it. You can watch the head on of the Withers. Well, I mean, the Gotham, excuse me. Gotham. When he, I mean, it's going back earlier in the meet, yeah. he knows where he has to be. Yeah, and, and he gives horses an opportunity to win. And you know what? We'd be remiss not to mention Jackie Davis winning on Shakespearean Dream, paying $92 plus. She's been doing that a long time, Meg. She was doing it at Parks. Before she got here and was doing it, you know, a year ago, she was lighting it up with these $90 horses at Parks. Robbie Davis, quite the sire. We know about the riding, yeah. but quite the sire. Quite the sire. Three of his kids riding, and John Santagata doing a good job for Jackie Davis. She's her agent, so happy for them. And we want to see you guys and have you participate. Trips and traps at NairInc.com. We could always use your help. We'll see you next week.